Amen. Thank you, Brother Dalton. Glad you're here tonight. If you need a handout, I think we still have some out there. Do we, Brother Mitchell? And so if you've not, oh, they're back there right there. So if you need a handout tonight, if you could hold your hand up, and they'll put a hand outside if you'd like one tonight, as we continue our series on what is church. All right, there's one up here, Brother Joe, and I'm looking at some over here, Brother Jared over there. And uh, good, if you'll need that one of those, hold your hands up. If you'd like one tonight. There are no pictures of me, so you can't doodle on that, but uh, you can do a good job of filling in all the little colors and uh, making the letters other letters. I know you all do that. I've done that. I've been guilty of that as well, and trying to guess some of the blanks and pre-fill out the blanks. That's okay as well, and so I gave you a few blanks tonight. There's much controversy in Baptist churches about whether to give blanks or no blanks. It's a serious business, Dr. Flanders. Blanks or no blanks? You have the non-blankers. Those who say, I'm too distracted. If I have to fill, I'm not listening, so give me all the blanks so I can focus. The non-blankers. Then you have the blankers. I get too distracted, Pastor, so give me a blank so then I focus more. And who is right? Only the Lord will tell us when we get to heaven. But until that day, today is a blanker. All right, so you got blanks in there tonight. As we look at the series, what is church? You know that church is important. Did you know that? You're here tonight on a Wednesday night at First Baptist Church. We're a church. We're not just a social gathering, though a lot of socializing happens at First Baptist Church. You know, sometimes people, people even meet and get married around church. In fact, uh, on New Year's, New Year's Eve, Brother Zach Evans, all right, he preached for us that night, of course, with his dad and, and Brother Wayne. And I am told that he started really being attracted to his wife, if I have the story right, when he and his wife, not then but now, worked on my wife and I's bus route. If we'd only knew then what we know now, his parents would have made sure they got to go on a bus route. Socializing happens at church, that's okay, but we're not merely a social gathering. We're not here just for financial reasons, though financial things take place at a church. We're not here just because we have nothing better to do on a Wednesday night in 2021. Now, I'm sure in a crowd this size that there are some people who have nothing better to do. Equally as sure that some of you could find something else to do. So I wanted to take some time in the next few weeks and last week to look at this thing we call church. Define what the church is and what it isn't. This is this, this is this first set of lessons. What is church? From there, the good Lord willing, if he allows us to continue in this, we'll go to the topic, which church? Why are we a Baptist church? Why aren't we Methodist? Why aren't we called the wind blowing in the breeze? A lot of churches changing their names out there. But let me say that again. There's a lot of churches changing their names out there. Now, I don't know all the reasons why. I've had some men tell me why they've changed their name and, and the reason they have told me. I don't know about all of them. The reason they've told me is that when they change their name, it seems to remove barriers. So, in essence, they're trying to get people to come to a church that they don't know it's a church. Now, this strikes me as odd. I'm a thinker. I try to be a thinker. Wouldn't someone figure it out when they walk in the back door? Like if I called this thing the First Baptist Trampoline Park. Wouldn't they figure it out once they walked in the back door and for sure at about two minutes into the service that this wasn't a trampoline park but it was actually a church? So I could call this the river, but you walk in there, there's no river here. It's a church. We're a church. I'm not trying to hide that fact. If that's offensive to somebody, I'm sorry. I get the, the word church from the Bible. That's why we call it a church. We didn't make it up. We didn't think, oh, this will be a neat name for it. Uh, God, we get that from, from, from the Bible. So this thing, what is church? I want to give a little bit of review. Then we'll hit those notes on what is a local church. Uh, the church, as we mentioned last week in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, the Bible says where Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, and I say un also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. 
couple ideas of what that particular verse means, and men smarter than me have weighed in what that means. Some believe it is upon the concept that Peter has just talked about, about how Jesus Christ is the Lord, the Son of God, Son of the living God. And that is a rock. Upon this rock, the church is founded upon, founded upon Jesus Christ. He could also be referring to Peter himself, the name Peter Petra in the Greek rock, the fact that Peter would play a large role at the beginning of the early church at Pentecost. But most likely, if you asked me and, and threatened my life what I believed, I would say that the Lord was referring to both concepts. But Jesus often, when he spoke, used something here and something here and something way up here. And not only was the truth the rock of the church, the fact that Jesus is the Son of the living God, but that also Peter would play a very significant role in the foundation of the church. No matter what, I love the rest of that verse, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Heard some tremendous messages from this pulpit, from pastor, from other speakers, about how that particular promise is one of offense, not defense. Does not say that our gates will stop the, the minions of hell, but the gates of hell, all right, we're storming the gates, shall not prevail against it. The gospel is powerful. The truth of Jesus Christ is, 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 is the power of the living God, the power of God unto salvation. In the, the Greek word is dunamis, we get our word dynamite from. It is power. It is not to defend, but to offend, all right, to go on the offensive. So when we give the gospel, it is Jesus Christ working in hearts and lives. And we at First Baptist Church have seen the power of the gospel. We have seen lives transformed. I'm talking about all of us. And if you haven't seen it, then take the scales off your eyes and look around and look inside your own life. I've experienced and seen the power of the gospel in my life and lives of others. So we have this thing called church. Churches are under attack from within and from without. They're under attack within, from, within, from without of culture, within and from false teachers. Recently heard someone talk about in their church they were going to start a brand new thing, or a new thing for the new year, and they're going to meet on Sunday nights. And go through the Bible and preach through it verse by verse. And use the Bible to preach Sunday nights. New thing for 2021. Wow. We call that our evening service. Maybe they'll have a midweek service soon. You know, the Bible says that the closer we get to Jesus Christ coming, we ought to gather more and more. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews. And yet, does it not seem that that is the exact opposite of the current trend in churches? Well, we're not getting further away from the time of Jesus Christ coming back. We're getting closer to it, right? It's just logical. It's just biblical. We're closer to, to the day than when we were yesterday. It's closer to that time. So we ought to be meeting more and more, but it's just the opposite right now. We don't want to cramp people's busy, busy schedules. And I mentioned this some last week. I had one particular person tell me this. They went down to one service a week so they could really focus a lot of effort in that one service. I'm a questioner. I'm a thinker. I posed the question, well, what could we do if we just had one service a year? Be really powerful. But why stop there? One service a decade. Once every 10 years. Can you imagine what that service would be like? Can you imagine how long I could preach if I had 10 years to prepare one sermon? You wouldn't stay that long, I promise you. <laughs> Listen, if you don't want to go to church three times a week, then just say, I don't want to go to church three times a week. Don't make up some reason. I mentioned last week I had someone else tell me, well, sometimes the Holy Spirit leads me to stay home from church on Wednesday nights. If you don't want to go to church, then just don't go to church. But don't blame the Spirit of the living God on your pathetic excuse to skip assembling together with other believers. The Holy Spirit led me to stay home. No, he didn't. 
Just be a man, be a woman, and say, listen, I don't feel like going. I don't want to please Jesus Christ. I don't want to assemble together. I don't want to grow spiritually, so I'm going to stay home. I have much more respect to that than someone who says, the Holy Spirit told me to stay home. Ask me what I really think about it. Maybe I'll tell you. So what is church? The church in the Bible is the called out, the assembly. Everyone who's saved is part of what I would call the universal church. All believers are, in a sense, part of Christ's church. And the Bible is a picture of, of Christ and the church, not just one particular church, but the church. All believers who believe in Jesus Christ, past, present, and future. The key component of that is salvation. That is the rock that binds us, the tie that binds us together, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have a, a unity, a partnership with other Christians. Listen, there are some tremendous churches in Saginaw, Michigan. Not all of them believe the same way that we do. But they're tremendous churches. They're not the enemy. They're not the enemy. The devil's the enemy. All right, the world is the lost. But I'm fighting the devil. We're trying to have the gospel save the world. The enemy's not the other churches. Well, that church, you should see that church. They, they do it differently. They have church at 1030, not 11 o'clock. Whew. They're probably not even going to heaven. <laughs> well, you should see that pastor doesn't even wear a tie. Oh, whoa. I remember that little verse, and Jesus tightened up his tie before he spoke on the mountain. <laughs> Maybe you remember that one. Now listen, I'm wearing a tie tonight. You see that? I almost always wear a tie here at First Baptist Church. Old-fashioned Sunday, down-home Sunday, I typically don't. And for our camp revival, I didn't. But I, I wear a tie. Why do you wear a tie, Pastor? Do you like ties? Actually, I kind of do. Oh, you're weird. <laughs> if you only knew. <laughs> All right, this doesn't make me weird. All right, I'm weird for a lot of reasons. Don't ask my wife. She won't tell you. I like wearing a tie, but... I find in Saginaw, Michigan, for what we're doing, um, this is the way I ought to dress. But I tell you what, if I was in the middle of the Caribbean in 115 degree weather and 110% humidity, oversaturation, being Puerto Rican, and if I can, sweating like a Puerto Rican, you probably wouldn't catch me wearing a tie. I'll tell you right now, the church. Is also what we call the local church. Tonight, with the Lord's help, I'm going to look at some things in your books. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help tonight. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for the time we have. Lord, bless this time. Help us. Lord, we need your wisdom, your knowledge, and your help. And Lord, I pray that tonight you'd open our eyes. And Lord, there may be some things that we didn't know or didn't understand. I pray that you'd reveal those to us. And Lord, maybe even something that we at first would even maybe disagree with. Lord, would we please look at your word and and get our thoughts, our opinions, and our doctrine, our belief from your word. Lord, help us now. Help me as I speak in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have the big, wide, what I'd call universal church. Everyone who is saved is part of that. And then I have or what we have what the Bible calls or refers to, in a sense, as a local body of believers, a local church. We find that in Romans. Still not there to your notes yet, but we're almost there. Though. In Romans, where Paul says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which, which is at Sancria. He's referring to a certain lady in a certain assembly of believers in a certain town. We find a church at Corinth, all right? Not all the believers of all time were at Corinth, but a local body of believers were, was at the city of Corinth. And in Bridgeport, Michigan, we have a local body of believers, all right, like-minded individuals that we, have, we call the local church. Find the foundation for that in Acts of the day of Pentecost when the Lord added to the church and such as it would be saved and, and thousands were saved and these churches began to spring up and the gospel went all over the place and these local churches. I'm thrilled to be part of such a tremendous church. I was touched Sunday night. Of course, we preached on the Word of God and challenged uh, all of us to spend the next 21 days every single day in God's Word. And over 250, over 250 individuals committed to spend 21 days in God's Word. 
That is unbelievable. Can you imagine what the power could be found if we make that a habit in our life? Where everyone in this church every day spends time with God, either reading or listening to God's word and trying to get it right inside here. The possibilities are endless, what God's word. His word will not return void. So encouraged, and many of you have also embarked upon the, maybe not knowing where to read, the book of John with us. And, and praise the Lord for that. Some who have mentioned that they have never even spent time in God's word before, now spending time in God's word. What a blessing to be part of a tremendous thing God is doing at a local church. And across the nation, across the globe, God is doing things in his church and in local churches. Local church, we have certain things here at a local church, like, like we have a certain schedule. 10 o'clock Sunday school, 11 o'clock church. You know the basic schedule. You know when to stand up, when to sit down. But what makes up a local church? What makes up a church? And, and we have sometimes some ideas that aren't maybe necessarily biblical, but maybe tradition. I'm not saying they're bad, but they're not found necessarily in God's Word. For, for instance, some say, well, if you don't start at 11, well, it's not really church because church always starts at 11 o'clock. And we'd say that's foolish. If I knew, listen, if I knew that we could triple the crowd and start at 11.05, I would start at 11.06, just in case I could quadruple it. There's nothing sacred about 11 o'clock in the morning. All right? I do think it's biblical to have a morning service and an evening service. Um, we use pews at First Baptist Church. Now, for some, pews are, are, are a, uh, a statement of faith. I like pews. We have chairs up in our balcony. We have chairs up in the choir loft. Could a church be a church without pews? Well, sure. I know some places around the world that they can't meet in a building. They have to meet inside of a house. They have pews there? No. The answer is no, they don't. But those dear folks in China have no less a church because they don't have some pews there. But pews are, are wonderful. I have no problem with that. So let's look at some things tonight, some elements of a local church. You have your notes there. We dig into this. We will probably not finish this all, and I'm not going to rush through. I want us to know, and once again, the idea is what church and then which church. The last session of this will be why church. My goal at that point is to put it all together where the rubber meets the road, why you're here. I want to build that foundation first. I may dig in a little bit deep at times. If I do, I'll try not to lose you. If I lose you, do like you normally do, fall asleep. I'll wake you back up, and uh, we'll continue on. Elements of a church, and the first one we talked about briefly last week, preaching and teaching. That is a part, an element of a local church. All right, we are not here just to have a beautiful time together. Now, we have an emphasis here on music at First Baptist Church. I find that emphasis in the Bible on music. In fact, there's a whole book of the Jewish songs called the Book of Psalms. But if we every week just came and sang together and never had any preaching and teaching, we would miss a fundamental part of the church. Now, is there a set time limit to what preaching and teaching should be. Whew. Well, now you get to some, some serious discussions among people. There are some that say, listen, bless God, if my church, my congregation, cannot sit there for an hour and a half, then they're not good Christians. Now, should we be able to sit for an hour and a half of the Word of God being presented? Yes or no, should we? Yes, we should. But even now, some of you good Christians are like, oh boy, but I hope, I hope that's not what you're saying tonight, Pastor. <laughs> now, I realize that our attention span in the 21st century has become very short, dangerously short. We can try to correct it, and, and we have a place for that, right? I'm not trying to correct it every single week. At the same time, I hope, I hope uh, that uh, we don't come to the place where it's five minutes and then we're out the door. It doesn't sound like you would handle the Word of God as diligently, as correctly as we want to. Preaching and teaching. But what's the difference between preaching and teaching? I posed some of these questions last week. Is, is preaching yelling and, and teaching very austere? 
Some would say that. Some would say you're only preaching if you're screaming your head off. It doesn't matter what the content is. A lot of you get the better preacher you are. You probably heard some of that or some I, a little of these, Brother Treadway, you know, from where you're down south down there. Some, some other people said this, well, preaching is for the heart and teaching's for the head. Right? Really, when someone's preaching, I also like to be intellectually engaged. Right? You, usually I like, I like it to make sense up here as well. Like, oh, I see what you're saying, and of course I want to touch here. When Jesus taught, well, look at how he taught, Jesus was not just teaching for the head. Jesus was teaching for here as well. So I don't think that's quite the definition. And, and someone else has said this, well, preaching is interesting, full of stories, and teaching is just full of facts. All right? The word in the Bible most often used for preaching and preacher is keruer, to herald, to deliver significant news. The word for teacher refers to more of instructor. At a fundamental level, a church must have both. At a fundamental level, we must not only proclaim the truth, preach, but also instruct the way. I want to go through and give you a couple of things here. What happened? First of all, there's a, not a blank there, but it said Paul did both. Look at that scripture in your handout. Acts chapter 15, 35. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch. What are the next three words? Help me. Teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So Paul did both of those things, teaching and preaching, right? Uh, scripture says, right? Uh, shake him around. Can you see that? Paul and Barnabas did both those things. And you can't tell me, well, Paul was preaching and Barnabas was teaching. No, no. They did both of these things. Another passage here, Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 28. Who now rejoice, this is Paul speaking, in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. All right, what's the name of this series? What is church? You look at that. Verse 25, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Verse 26, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we, it's the next word, preach. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may, here's the purpose of those two things, present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Paul says the reason that we are preaching and warning every man and teaching in all wisdom is just so that every man can stand complete before him, fully complete. Not perfect that you will have no sin, but blameless before the Almighty God. So that you are blameless in salvation and holy in sanctification and how you live. Preaching and teaching. We'll continue our notes though. Paul did both of those things. The next blank there, the early, the early Christians. The early Christians did both. Acts chapter 5 verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach where there's evangelize Jesus Christ. They are the Christians in both those things. Not only that, the next blank there is Timothy was instructed to do both things. So Paul did both things. The early Christians did both things. Timothy was instructed to do both things. 1 Timothy 4, verse 11 through 13. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity till I come. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Titus 1, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. As you can see, I'm kind of building a, a scenario here. Paul did both these things. The early Christians did both these things. Timothy was instructed to do both things. The next blank, Jesus. 
did both. Jesus did both. Let's look at the scripture here, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to, what's the word? Preach. And to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, verse 23 says this, just six verses later, and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogue and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. I think it is fairly clear that an element of the local church is preaching and teaching. Now, the reason I bring this up is not to insult your intelligence, but there is a thought out there that a pastor, that a church, either does one or the other. Either I'm a preacher or I'm the lead teacher. Right? And I find in Scripture both things. There's an element of men out there who say, I just teach. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict and correct, and I just, I just give the facts of Scripture. And there's another element of men who at times seems to not use much, much Scripture and just try to correct a few things. I find in Scripture that an element of a local church is preaching and teaching. Let me give you some definitions here that you have them on your paper there. First one, the first blank there is preaching. Here's a definition. To, to proclaim the truth. Proclaiming the truth with passion, with a purpose of confrontation and change. When we have preaching, we can illustrate it this way. I'm coming down, and I'm saying, listen, I'm going to step in your business tonight. You need to put your phones away during church. I can say it softly, or I can scream my head off. The fact remains the same. And it is true, during church, you've got to have your phones away. You can have your Bible out on it, but the phones are a distraction during church at First Baptist Church. And don't say I don't see that from up here. During the song service, get your phones out. Oh, don't look at me like I don't know what's going on. My eyesight's still excellent. For 44 years, you had Pastor Olette. End of that time, he had to put glasses on to see far. I'm only 40 right now. I can still see the back of the auditorium. I can see what you're doing and see you back there. And don't, see, don't think I can't see a reflection of light coming off your face. And don't try to convince me that you're just looking at your Bible. When you look at this, the light's coming off your face and you crack a smile. I've been told I'm a, that I can be a funny person. I typically know where the laugh lines are going to be. So I know if what I'm going to say is going to be relatively funny or if you're reading something else on your phones. All right? Preaching says, put your phones away, you rotten, filthy rebels, and open your hearts to the Word of God. While you're at it, while you're at it, cut down your time on social media. No place for, there's no place to waste your time. Listen, you can use it. I'm not, I'm not saying it's sinful. But there's some people in this church who use it in a sinful way. Use it in a sinful way. You get in arguments on social media? Shame on you. Shame on you. All right, right now, First Baptist Church, we're posting things on social media. We're posting a chapter from the book of John every day. Some of you would be well served to not only read it, but to share that post. It'd be the most spiritual post you shared the last year. You say, Pastor, are you on Facebook? I am. I post about once a year. The rest of the time, I just lurk. But I don't lurk that much. You know why? Because I found before when I was lurking, sometimes I'd get discouraged. I'm serious, you know? And you're like, Pastor, you don't seem very discouraged normally. It takes a lot from me, but some of you have done that to me. Now, I'm, not, I'm not lying to you. I'm being transparent now. And I'm like, you know what? I can't read this stuff. It's not good for my mind. Then some people come and tell me, well, you know, so-and-so is doing this. I don't want to hear that. Listen, put it away. You'd be well, you'd be well served, all right, if you limited your time on social media. And I don't really care. I don't really care if you like their censorship right now. All right? I don't care your thoughts on it. I really don't. All right? You can be for or against it, whatever you think. I just frankly don't care. You know why? You know why? Because we got a whole lot more to worry about. 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a lost world dying and going to hell, and that not just the world, Saginaw, Michigan. And if you spent the same amount of time witnessing to people that you spend posting things, there wouldn't be any more lost people in Saginaw. That's preaching. We could have an invitation right now. Not many people would come. You know why? Because some of you inside your spirit are not happy. You know, the one who, you know, now Brother Mitchell, he doesn't have social media. You hear him yelling amen back there. He thinks when I say Facebook, it means get the Bible close to your face. Facebook. <laughs> just, yes. <laughs> well, some of you have that. You're like, well, he should just mind his own business. What does he know anyway? You're right. I should, but I won't. It's preaching. That's what Timothy says. Preach the word. Be in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Purpose of confrontation and change. The idea is, listen, here, you know what? Make a decision. Sunday night when I preached about spending time in God's word at the end of the sermon, I asked you two questions. First question was, how many of you have spent the last seven days in the word of God? Question number one. You had to answer that or ignore it. Next question was, would you commit to spend the next 21 days with God every single day, a decision you had to make. Now, you could make that decision a couple ways. You could say, yeah, I think I'll pass. Reject it. You could reject it this way. I'm not doing that. Still a rejection. Yeah, I think about it. Still a rejection. But you're faced with a decision. Preaching, I would say, is proclaiming the truth with passion. Doesn't mean you have to yell, but it's coming from the inside out. You believe what you're saying with a purpose of confrontation and change. Teaching, instruction of truth, with a passion, I'm sorry, with passion, with a purpose of obedience and growth. Teaching is related to obedience. Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount. Peacemakers, meek, love your enemies, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Jesus was not merely saying these things so you could say, oh, those are nice things you say. No, the purpose was obedience. Live this way as well. Teaching instruction of the way is, listen, here's how to live a, a, a life that will please Jesus Christ. Often on Wednesday nights, I try to have more of a teaching format. We don't always have an invitation. We probably won't tonight on a Wednesday night. I'm trying to teach some, some truth about the Word of God, about the local church. Try to instruct you, give you some doctrine so that you have the right foundation for beliefs in your life so that when someone says, well, I go to good church and, and, and we only meet this time, you can say, wait a second, I thought this was an element of the church from the Bible. I'm not trying to instruct a certain way. And we find that in Matthew chapter 28, 19, and 20 where Jesus says, Go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, of the Holy Ghost, teaching them... All right, teaching them, instructing them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Teaching and preaching are uniquely different. But both are to be done at church. A sermon ought to be proclaimed with passion for confrontation and change with obedience and growth. At church, we want to hear sometimes how we're messing up. What God says, how we need to live and change today and tomorrow. And preaching and teaching are a fundamental element of the local church. If you go to church and there's never any preaching and teaching, switch churches. Switch churches. Find a church where there's preaching and teaching from the Word of God. I do my best to be a diligent student of the Word of God. I don't want to get up here Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night and just be on a hobby horse. Do I ever hit hobby horses? Probably do. I try not to. I try to be led by the Holy Spirit and say, okay, God, what's in your word? The power doesn't come from me and how I deliver it. The power comes from the word of God. You walk out and the Holy Spirit says, you dirty, rotten scoundrel, what's wrong with you? Preaching and teaching. One more element tonight, then we'll be, we'll be done tonight, is prayer. Prayer is a fundamental element of the early church, and ought to be an element of this local church. Acts chapter 2, 
which is 41 and 42, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Begin to pray early on the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. We find this theme throughout the rest of the New Testament and the epistles. I brought down just three, three aspects or three ways we pray, three things to pray for that the church prays for. And number one, we pray for needs. We pray for needs. It's okay to pray for needs. That's what Philippians, Paul says to Philippians, be careful for nothing or quit your worrying. Quit fretting. Quit being afraid. Quit being scared out of your mind. Be careful for nothing. Am I allowed to be afraid? Not according to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. I'm not allowed to have fear sit in my heart and worry in my heart. He says, be careful for nothing. Not for finances. Not for the safety of my children. Not for COVID-19. Careful, I'm going to start preaching again. Now, I'm not making this up. I'm not on a hobby horse. That's what the scripture says. Be careful for nothing. It doesn't say that there's not trouble in life. There's not hardship in life. There's not real battles in life. It just says, I, as a Christian, I'm not allowed to worry about it. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything. And what? Everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I'm allowed to go to my Heavenly Father, me. I'm allowed to ask Him for my requests. I don't have to pray just for your request, though I pray for many of your requests, and if you have requests, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to pray for it. But I'm allowed to pray for my requests. Let your requests be made known. I'm allowed to have a relationship with my Heavenly Father who will listen to me pray for needs. And as a church, we can pray for our needs. We ought to pray for others. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we can pray for our needs. Lord, help First Baptist Church. Lord, help this church to be strong in the faith. Lord, grow this church. Lord, help this, faith, help this church to be strong financially. Help it to be strong and soul winning. Lord, let this church be a good lighthouse in Saginaw, Michigan. And Lord, help this dear member who's sick right now. Let your requests. And Lord, I'd love to have this problem in my life fixed. Let your requests. And Lord, as long as I'm asking, I wouldn't mind this over here. I don't need it. I sure would like it. Let your requests. We're allowed to pray that way. Prayer is a fundamental part of the local church. Not only for needs, number two, for healing. Pray for healing. That's straight out of James chapter 5. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. That's a promise from the word of God that prayer heals people. Is God still doing miracles? Well, apparently he will if we ask him. The prayer of faith will, will heal. Well, I'm sorry. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. Dr. Flanders, there's a little doubt in my mind that you're sitting here because of the prayer of faith. We can pray for healing. Listen. Don't rob someone else of a loved one because you can't be bothered to pray for them. We have needs in this church every day. You pray. And you talk to your Heavenly Father and say, Lord, so-and-so sick. Touch him, Lord. You pray for them. The Bible says the prayer of faith shall save the sick. We pray for healing in the church. And lastly, we pray for others. The Bible says, Ephesians 1, 16, 17, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you my prayers. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge of him. Prayer, fundamental element 
of a local church. Hope you're part of a praying church. Now, if you're First Baptist Church, I hope you're part of the praying at First Baptist Church. Well, my time is gone for tonight. I know we go hour and a half. I go another hour. But come back next week, and we'll continue on in this, the elements of a local church. And I hope along the way that if you have a question, you'll ask me. And then you can get in place now as you're getting in place now. The next point on there is giving. You see that. That's the next point of our service anyway. Uh, but we'll get there next week on giving as part of a local church. And ought to be. But uh, when we did some of these series before, we had a text question, text to question number. And we'll get that back up on the screen. So if you have a question on the way, Pastor, you said this. What did you mean by this? I was always wondering about this at church. And Lord willing, it'll be a, a help to you as you understand what a church is. Once again, I'm building the foundation. Then I'm going to preach on, Lord willing, which church? Why do we have a Baptist church? And then I'll put it together. And that'll be a preaching night right now. I'll tell you right now, why church? And your response to all of that. That's a confrontation, all right, with the expectation of change. All right, and uh, uh, I won't get ahead of myself there. So, all right, men, come for the offering. If you wouldn't, let's stand as we take an offering. Thanks, thank you again for your faithfulness and your generosity. God has been so gracious to us, and you as a church have been so generous. We are in Stewardship Month at First Baptist Church. And we give, all right, not just because there are needs. We give because God has entrusted us his blessings. And he's given us riches. He's given us money and time and talents. And we give back to him because it's his anyway. That's why we give. All right, we're glad you're here. We pray for the offering, if you would, Brother Cody. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this church. I pray that we would please you this week. And please use this offering for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.